Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, please take a seat. And it seems this is the time to continue our to this event. So I welcome all of you. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank all panelists as well as the petitioner for being here today and sharing their experiences and expertise of the subject matter of climate change in the near. Your contributions are a valuable input in the process of getting a better understanding of the different drivers, techniques, and strategies behind this very complex matter. Today we will come to panels, one, of, one on uh, climate change Daniel, uh, general overview, and uh, one on climate change Daniel communication techniques and misinformation, the Exxon Mobil case. With such a program, I'm sure that uh, this hearing will allow, allow for uh, many clarifications on the matter and the particularly timely moment as uh, we see within Europe many citizens and many youngsters raising their voices and transmitting their concerns on the climate challenges our planet is facing. This hearing has been organized following a petition we received in 2016, number uh, 900 from 2016 on behalf of uh, Food and Water Europe, bearing 732 signatures on taking action against a multinational oil company for climate change denial. In the petition, the petitioner, together with the co-signatories, uh, would like the European Parliament to take action against a multinational oil company for its climate change denial. The petitioner informed the Committee on Petitions about the ongoing investigation in the United States on the same issue. The petitioner lists all uh, the adverse effect of uh, climate change and its denial on the environment, public health, agriculture, water sources, tourism, energy policy, or transport policy. The petitioner will be given the floor at the beginning of the second panel of today. And now I uh, leave the floor to my colleague, uh, Madame Valdean, who is the chair of the Committee on the Environment, Public Health and Food Safety for uh, her introductory remarks. Madame Chair, welcome, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, colleague Chaki, um, dear colleagues, uh, members of the parliament, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I join uh, my colleague, Mr. Chaki, in thanking you for being here today to share your expertise and your views on this delicate and important topic. And I'm looking forward to hear your uh, thoughts on this subject. The fight against climate change is at the core of Environment Committee work. And the possible denial of climate change and its negative effects on the environment and the public health would go very much against this fight. Transparent communication is, of course, needed to help citizens to be informed about the science behind fight against climate change. That's why the Environment Committee agreed to organize this public hearing today together with Petty Committee in order to put some light and exchange views on this important but relatively unknown topic. As you all know, um, ExxonMobil which is mentioned in the petition, which constituted the base of uh, this uh, public hearing, was invited to participate, but was not able to do so due to pending litigations in the US. An official letter sent by ExxonMobil explaining the situation and containing a possible reaction to today's debate has been circulated uh, with all um, members of the Environment Committee in order to ensure full transparency. We have uh, uh, several panelists invited for today. They will be uh, given 15 minutes to present their views, each of them, each 15 minutes. Um, we'll have, as it was said, two panels, uh, and each of these two panels will be followed by time for debate with uh, the members. 
The title of the first panel is Climate Change Denial, a general overview, and we have uh, two exquisite experts for this panel. It's about uh, Mr. Eugène Pascal Van Ypersel, who is Professor of Climatology at the University of Louvain, who will make a general introduction on climate change denial, followed by Mr. Alexander Karius, Manager Director of Adelphi, who will give us an overview of climate change denial in politics. So, I will start with the first one. So, uh, Professor Ypersel, you have the floor for 15 minutes. Yes, thank you very much, I'm here. Yeah. Thank you very much, Madam President, for this uh, opportunity to uh, introduce the, um, the subject, and I know other colleagues will uh, emphasize particular points, uh, but I'd like to give uh, you a general introduction from the uh, point of view of a climate scientist working on climate change for the last 40 years and having been vice chair of the IPCC until 2015. First, uh, as a word of introduction about the vocabulary, I would like to um, explain uh, why I prefer personally to speak about climate confusers. I reserve the word uh, denialist to those who deny the Holocaust, and uh, this is out of respect for the victims of the Shoah. Second, I don't speak either of climate skeptics, because uh, skepticism is at the root of the scientific method and those uh, climate confusers, as I prefer to call them, should not be given the monopoly of skepticism. This expression was suggested to me by a, a Twitter friend. First, a reminder about the speed at which the temperature is increasing. This is the global temperature since 1850. Uh, this is the reality. Uh, we are getting very close to the 1.5 degree limit, as you can see here. And this is what you, you can still find uh, f from time to time on, on, on Internet, on Facebook, etc. Emphasis on the fact that until recently, because this stops in 2011, this diagram stops in 2011, the temperature didn't give the impression of rising very much. And, uh, you know, there was much uh, emphasis on the so-called uh, pause or hiatus in temperature. Of course, this is totally biased because you could have found many times similar periods of uh, a few uh, years uh, showing sometimes even a decrease in temperature. And very clearly, this is lying with statistics, and this is the kind of techniques that uh, climate confusers uh, like to, uh, to use. Another uh, spiral I'd like to show you is the uh, rapid increase in the concentration of CO2 uh, since 1850 again, and this is presented in a way which helps to compare this increase in the concentration of CO2 to the increasing thickness of um, the, an insulation layer around the planet. And this is why the temperature is actually uh, increasing. Uh, another way to show this uh, increase in the CO2 concentration is this one, showing uh, the evolution of this concentration over the last 10,000 years and the explosion until two days ago, and I don't think it will stop in the next uh, few years, um, until uh, a, a concentration that is uh, about almost 50% higher than the pre-industrial uh, value. If you look at this um, uh, table coming out of a scientific publication published in 1975, a long time ago, you can see that the estimate this scientist who just died a few weeks ago, unfortunately, made for the year 2010 uh, for, in terms of concentration was 403 parts per million in 2010, very close to what we are observing, to what we observed then. And in terms of temperature, he projected a temperature increase of 1.1 degrees C above the pre-industrial temperature, which is exactly where we are now. So the science has been very clear for a long time, and this, is, uh, this temperature increase is really because we have been using the atmosphere as a big dustbin, a free dustbin, uh, and we are therefore thickening the insulation layer around the planet. And this comparison helps to understand, without any complicated climate model, why we must cut emissions to net zero as soon as possible to stop the increase uh, 
in the thickness of this um, insulation layer. The uh, IPCC, and I'll say a word about the IPCC in a second, has uh, of course looked at the relationship between uh, this uh, increase in the concentration of CO2 in other greenhouse gases and the temperature increase which you see here, attempting to model it uh, either uh, with the, the blue method, which is shown here, which is uh, using only natural factors, or the red method, which is using natural factors and natural factors, and it's clearly only with uh, this latter combination that the reproduction of the observed increase is possible, which led the IPCC to become increasingly confident uh, about the uh, strength of the link, the link between um, the uh, human factors and the, uh, the warming, as you can see here with those extracts from IPCC uh, reports. The IPCC was created precisely uh, to, to, to highlight what, uh, coming from the scientific literature, is clear and what is less clear in a policy-relevant way, not only about the climate science, but also about the uh, solution space, uh, either in the adaptation area or the mitigation area. It was created more than 30 years ago, and I'd like to highlight uh, some key elements from uh, the uh, IPCC Working Group 1 report, Working Group 1 dealing with science. The first one is that emissions resulting from human activities are substantially increasing the atmospheric concentration of greenhouse gases. The IPCC calculated with confidence that under a business-as-usual scenario, the temperature would increase by about 3 degrees, actually a range from 2 to 5 degrees, and that sea level would increase as well, with a range of 30 centimeters to 1 meter. It also concluded that episodes of high temperature would most likely become more frequent, that some species would become extinct, and that immediate reduction in long-term greenhouse gases would be needed. Oh. Um. My apologies, Ms. Ms. Uh, Ms. Uh, President, my apologies. Um, I, I was um, rushing to prepare this presentation and I probably made a mistake because uh, this is uh, actually, these slides actually from the first IPCC report. I really apologize. <laughs> this is to say, of course, this is not entirely true. Uh, but it's true that these are quotations from the first IPCC report with numbers which are very similar to the latest report. And uh, a key question then is, was anybody really listening? And if not, why? Because this is uh, almost 30 years ago. Uh, not to trick you anymore, I want to um, show you uh, the um, uh, key messages from the last uh, IPCC report in one slide. Human influence on the climate system is clear. Continued emissions of greenhouse gases would increase the likelihood of severe effects. Uh, climate change is really a threat to sustainable development, but there are many opportunities uh, in the solution space. And in summary, humanity has the means to limit climate change and build a more sustainable and resi resilient future. And I think on each of those four elements, the climate confusers have been, uh, are still very active. And their argumentation has evolved over time, going from the existence of the warming to the uh, uh, human responsibility. And today, it's much more focused on the uh, solutions, uh, which is linked to this uh, cartoon I like as well with uh, uh, the, uh, speak, uh, the, the spokesperson for IPCC repeating the same message uh, over time uh, since uh, the first report in 1990 and asking uh, in uh, 2019, that's the year we are in, uh, if the, the microphone is working. So, um, the tension between science and politics have been, um, have been heavy, and this was particularly so uh, ahead of the Kyoto uh, Protocol negotiations in 97, and I'd like to um, um, highlight uh, a personal experience I had, and uh, this is, as you will see, is very close to the subject of the day. Uh, a U.S. climatologist uh, came uh, to Brussels um, at that time and uh, said this, uh, the um, accumulation 
uh, of CO2 in the atmosphere is not well understood. There is no reason to expect that those, uh, the trends between emissions and atmospheric concentration would continue in the future. Uh, contrary to what uh, the IPCC is trying to make you believe, the observations do not confirm that human activities have led to any global warming. The warming is only half a degree, he said then, over the last 140 years. This is entirely within the range of natural uh, fluctuations. The projections are based on unverified uh, models of uh, natural and social science. The results from climate, climate models are known to be wrong. It's impossible today to project future impacts of climate change. Uh, and progress uh, will require major effort in terms of research and many years of study. Well, this U.S. scientist was Dr. Flannery, the science advisor to Exxon Research and Engineering. Uh, he has a PhD in astrophysics and he was speaking and sowing doubts on the way to the Belgian delegation about to leave for the final negotiations of the Kyoto Protocol. Uh, this was on November 21st, 1997, at a lunch event organized by the Belgian Oil Industry Federation. The next day, Dr. Flannery presented a similar talk to a few hundred secondary school science teachers in the city, the Belgian city of Ghent. Another illustration of the efforts and maybe one of the explanations why it took so long for the IPCC reports to come to the surface and to uh, uh, provoke the awareness that you see now in the streets is this memo uh, sent to the White House uh, from the ExxonMobil Washington office in 2001, just after uh, George Bush, uh, the father, took office. And uh, the title of this memo is Bush Team for IPCC Negotiations. And uh, one element in that long text is Ken Watson, who was then the IPCC chair, removed now at the request of the US elections uh, were about to take place a year later in the IPCC and uh, Dr. Watson was not uh, re-elected. I would be curious personally to know about uh, the memos that circulated around foss fossil fuel companies in exporting countries and maybe, they'll, maybe historians will uh, find them out one day when I run for the IPCC chair position in 2015. We'll know that later maybe. In the U.S. alone, organizations which sow doubt about climate change spend almost a billion dollars per year to sow doubt about the different dimensions of the climate issue. The argumentations, as I mentioned earlier, has evolved over time. It went from uh, denying the existence of global warming to uh, sowing doubt about the human responsibility emphasizing the uncertainty, uncertainties around the science, um, arguing that more research was needed before taking measures, uh, emphasizing the very high cost, according to them, of decarbonization and uh, the neglect of the opportunities, and uh, insisting on the drawbacks from alternatives. And you have an example there uh, if you click on the link uh, in that slide, which will be available to you after my speech. In conclusion, Madam Chair, uh, knowledge about the climate problem and its solutions uh, is more than enough to lead to the urgent action needed. The climate confuses efforts, including those funded by fossil fuel lobbies, are slowing things down. The legislators, I believe, have a responsibility in this uh, respect. And I have a simple proposal uh, in two slides, if you allow me. Given that the planet has a serious fever, in a sense, Given that the planetary physicians, the climate scientists and the IPCC, have diagnosed very clearly the cause, that's fossil fuel addiction, given that climate confusion efforts by the fossil fuel and deforestation lobbies, because deforestation is a factor too, contribute to delay the implementation of the needed remedy, which is fast decarbonization, Given that these efforts by climate confusers are similar to those by tobacco lobbyists and anti-vaccination charlatans, given the role of social networks in spreading fake news about climate science, couldn't the European Parliament think about this, considering how to convince social networks, and I know the European Union 
as sometimes very powerful means of convincing Google and other actors, for example, of their responsibility in this regard and how to lead them to stop spreading climate disinformation. So humanity still has the choice today between the business as usual trajectory which will lead to immense suffering by the end of this century and later, both for people and ecosystems, or to uh, lead to a warmer world, because we cannot avoid some of the warming, but a world in which adaptation is much more uh, manageable. I have a book in French, a book in Dutch, not yet in English, but that will come. Uh, a, a source of information about IPCC uh, activities in French, and these are some websites, including the second website where my slides uh, will be available very quickly in the course of the day, in addition to being uh, available on the uh, European Parliament website. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Mr. Parcella. I, I cannot say, but uh, thank you for your presentation, it's very interesting. It's a pity you haven't been asked to brief the U.S. delegations to the meeting for the Kyoto Protocol, then maybe things would be... Well, I, I was there, Madam um, Chair, so I, uh, I, yes, I but co not for contradicted briefing, the... Uh, at yeah. least the Belgian delegation <laughs> was well informed. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Now we are going to listen from Mr. Karius uh, uh, with his presentation. Yes, please, you have the floor. Sorry. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, um, Madam Chair, um, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'm going to talk about climate change denial and politics. That's the official title uh, of my presentation. Is that coming up? Are you putting up the presentation? Maybe somebody will do. Um, you just informed. No, it's coming. Uh, which is about climate change denial and politics, but more precisely I'm going to talk about climate change denial and party politics, and what I'm going to say uh, is based on a study that we just published about convenient truth, uh, which is mapping uh, the climate agenda uh, of a group of parties uh, in Europe. And um, basically we did that for um, three reasons. One is we would like to create an empirical body uh, to test the argument whether denial um, or confusing about climate facts correlates with voting behavior in the European Parliament vis-a-vis uh, -vis energy and climate packages in the past. Um, we looked at voting behaviors there. Uh, we looked at 21 parties. 19 of them are represented in the European Parliament. Um, and uh, looking at their uh, uh, voting behavior, basically on these packages, and we would like to illustrate the growing anti-climate rhetoric uh, among parties uh, across Europe and also across uh, policy spectrums. Um, the sources that we used is uh, analysis of party programs, uh, statements by party representatives, uh, press releases, and more importantly, um, we looked at the voting behavior. And um, what we have found is basically that we can group uh, climate denial into three different groups. So we looked at parties uh, that are, can be characterized as uh, denial um, of climate, denial of climate facts, basically trend denial, so that there is no trend in global warming. Um, the attribution denial, which is basically denying human influence on uh, the production of uh, CO2 or the denial of impact, so basically whether uh, a concentration of CO2 is actually impacting on the nation, nation, um, uh, natural environment, uh, but also on economy and society. There is a second group uh, which has a more cautious uh, approach, and among uh, these uh, 21 uh, parties there uh, is the largest group of 11 parties that have very little positions on that. They hardly rely on climate science. Sometimes they form a position, their voting behavior um, in the European Parliament um, has been mixed at this basically inconsistent uh, positions of that. And then we have a, another group uh, which is more affirmative, which is uh, supporting uh, climate action uh, to a certain degree, but domestically then uh, takes uh, different positions. And I will come back to uh, the question of to what extent the denial of facts of climate science is then also related and comes with a certain understanding of how society works and what society constitutes. Um, I just would like to illustrate the three 
uh, typologies that we have identified. So the basic argument, and I will not attribute any of these um, uh, quotations to any of the parties here in the parliament, uh, I was asked to do that, is that um, uh, the first is trend denial. So basically saying that um, uh, variation in climate, as um, you indicated right, in the beginning over uh, uh, more than a century cannot be explained. Um, it is um, either the result of radiation or climate or heat fluctuation. Um, it is basically here saying that nobody was able to convincingly speak about what it is and whether it has anything to do with human activity. And that's a very typical trend of just questioning facts and put that into the framework of either behavior or any kind of uh, ideology there. A second one is attribution of um, uh, denial. Um, so there is no direct link between increased levels of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and global warming. Uh, there are no clear indications of how that interacts. And the third one, it's uh, denying the impact. So governments are suppressing the positive effects of CO2 uh, on plant growth and th thus on, on global nutrition. Um, these Second typology of an, an disengaged, more cautious approach um, can be described basically by three lines of argumentation. One is facts versus belief or facts versus ideology, saying that I'm not a climate scientist. I think none of the politicians are climate scientists, but they take a stand on that. Uh, I think that human activity contributes in proportions to the phenomenon, uh, but I'm unable really to measure that. It's a typical argument to say there are two opinions in science, and I think particularly if you compare climate science to many other policy areas or climate policy to other policy areas, there is a high degree of consensus on the facts and on the science uh, <clears throat> that 97% uh, of the articles reviewed by the IPCC basically come to that conclusion and there is some sort of consensus. Uh, the second one is referring to uncertainties of the Earth's climate changes over time. We know very little about what effects these changes have, uh, which is not the case because basically that's the purpose of the IPCC um, and, um, <clears throat> and many other organizations, also civil society organizations, to uh, elaborate on the knock-on effects uh, on economy and society um, of global climate change. A third argument is that uh, it is rather a matter of manipulation, um, that of serious concern, manipulation related to economic interests and a lot of money, so past dependency on climate ch uh, uh, change signs. Um, it's the conspiracy argument. And the fourth one, um, it is more particularly in that group that have no clear stand on climate policy, uh, some kind of logical fractions there, saying on the one hand that climate policy is poisoning national economy, but then making the argument that emissions are uh, global, which is true, and should be reduced where it's cheapest. Um, that was an approach and basically is the idea of many of the climate policy instruments really to reduce um, the emissions where they are created, where they emerge, but also indeed uh, to uh, look for the most economical option to that. And a third one um, is the group of the, uh, the typology of the affirmative, uh, which are very much in favor um, and voting also in favor of climate and energy packages in the European Parliament. They can be described as progressive, but very nationalist. So basically looking particularly at the impacts for the national economy, taking stands on climate and energy and the promotion of renewable energy uh, for the sake of improving competitiveness of domestic economy um, and for the benefit um, of uh, your own country and your own people. Um, some of the uh, parties also are, had a very clear stand on agreeing that the Paris Conference, the Paris Agreement was a breakthrough in our attitude towards our planet, the future of which we are responsible for. So you have these two perspectives of nationalist uh, versus globalist. But what is interesting, because most of the, uh, of the uh, debate is focusing on climate science. So how do climate skeptics um, um, are dealing with uh, the scientific effects and how that tr translates then in, into policy. And we looked at the frames that uh, party representatives use in order to describe the impacts of climate change and basically um, identified that sometimes there is a moral bias, there is an ideological bias um, that, um, that very much uh, frames um, 
um, the, the climate risks. Um, and I would like to just shed light a few minutes on, 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 on four different arguments. One is that um, climate change is economically unfavorable, uh, that it is socially unfair, that it is harming the environment and particularly biodiversity and landscapes, and that's political ineffective and illegitimate. So the first one is basically the argument that climate policy harms domestic economy and competitiveness. Um, it is weakened local economy because of strict um, uh, st um, uh, emission standards. Uh, it is lowering the standards of living. It is squeezing out money of the business and also uh, by, by people. Uh, it is creating unprecedented economic atrocities. It is poisoning our economy and is uh, threatening economic growth. That's the gross argument, it's um, environment is harmful, it's very much relying on the cost argument. You never do, they never do really in their argumentation any kind of cost-benefit analysis. Uh, the argument of investing into what we agree is one of the biggest challenges of the 21st century. There is no argument in thinking about how much do we need to invest in order to embark on this kind of transformative change that the Paris Agreement is suggesting. A second uh, argument is uh, that it's socially unfair. Climate policy undermines social justice. Um, it basically, they claim that climate policy leads to rise, rising energy prices with uh, unjust effects, uh, particularly on poor households, uh, which is often the case, uh, particularly when it's, um, um, when, when you take um, isolated climate policy measures not embedded in larger uh, social justice, either reforms or accompanying uh, measures. It is concerned um, with affecting the poorest the most, uh, people without work and bread, or rubbing their hands uh, by those uh, political elites. So it's a mixture of social injustice, uh, but purposely introduced uh, in order to um, affect um, uh, the social fabric. A third argument is, sorry, is uh, that it is environmentally harmful. So climate policy negatively impacts national environment and cultural landscapes, uh, particularly with regard to wind turbines uh, affecting valuable agricultural and uh, scenery landscapes, native land destroy our common agriculture, etc. And the fourth argument is that climate policy measures are politically ineffective. Um, so particularly that unilateral climate policy measures are futile in light of large global emitters such as China, India or Russia. Um, the basic argument is that our country only accounts for a small fraction of global CO2 emissions. Um, so it is not worth really to uh, invest into emission reductions um, in larger economies within the uh, EU or in economies uh, in general, but we have to basically um, invest into and convince uh, that others, the largest emitters, uh, do their job. Um, and they also claim that only nations have the legitimacy and the means of action. And some uh, that, that we did, we also looked at, um, at the political risks of this argument. And basically, uh, I think there are three things we should keep in mind. First is that um, when we were asking about party politics and to what extent they are dealing with uh, climate science and climate risks, uh, they often come with a certain understanding about how society works and how a liberal democracy works. And uh, so our argument is that um, you often encounter party positions from a certain political spectrum that also bring in and translate illiberal ideas um, about the organization of the social fabric. And what we have witnessed in other policy areas, particularly on migration or regulation of migration and immigration policies, is that there is the risk of introducing um, not correct or fake news into the debate by shifting also a political debate in order to respond to public demand. I think that is a question also um, that we witnessed uh, recently when the European Parliament published a, um, a poll about uh, the upcoming European elections that uh, about 25% of the EU parliamentarians might belong to parties that promote climate skeptic arguments. Uh, we have climate skeptic 
parties uh, from in the conservative to right-wing spectrum that already form governments, uh, seven governments in the EU 28 um, member states. Uh, we might have representation in the European Commission. And I think what we observe, particularly in um, observation of um, the uh, Twitter traf traffic and uh, communication and social media, uh, that there is a shift right now from a certain political spectrum to move from migration to climate policy rhetoric. And I think um, the, <clears throat> what is striking is that if you use, look at the uh, voting behavior and if you look at the party programs and the statements by those parties uh, that are very basically saying that there is either no climate change or there is no human influence um, on, on global warming, that they have a certain understanding about policy making. And I think what is critical and typical for climate policy that is if you compare that to other policy sector, science-based. Science-based policy making, and that's the foundation of what we do, particularly because we have to take decision with long-term impacts over many, century, many de uh, decades, and we do that also under uncertainty. Uh, a second one is that particularly given the uncertainty and given the, uh, the transformative character of uh, embarking uh, and reaching a low carbon or zero carbon economy by the end of the century, there is a lot of discourse. And that discourse has to happen in the public space, either uh, due to uh, uh, participation and exchange with civil society, science, industry. Uh, but I think the forum um, that we need is, um, is basically parliaments, be that national parliaments um, or be that the European parliament. Um, a, th a third argument is uh, that it requires citizens' engagement and civil society engagement. A fourth argument is uh, that it very much relies on the idea of supranationalism and multilateralism. Nothing that we can do, we can do unilaterally, and it requires uh, the free press and also independent uh, jurisdiction. Thank you very much. I thank, I thank you very much. Very interesting uh, um, presentation. Now I open the floor for questions for these two panelists. Uh, I have to draw your attention that uh, we have 15 minutes for questions and answers. So um, uh, let's see who wants to take the floor. Members first. Mrs. Sokan. First and foremost, uh, thank you so much for your presentation. It's well, it's a little bit depressing because, you know, when, when the first IPCC report came in, in 1990 and was a member of the Danish parliament, had an interpreted uh, place in the Danish parliament uh, at that time in October, and I wrote a big article and everything is there, as you said. You know, all the, the arguments you could say we, gave, we went from 85% 80, security to 99, but that's the only basic uh, change, and then, of course, some of the consequences. And I think that... So my, my, my feeling on this here is that, of course, the denials has, has served, or confusing, as you said, better word, has served as a kind of a safeguarding of the lack of political will. The problem is not that the knowledge hasn't been there, because uh, I, you can follow it from the very beginning. My brother was participating in the culture from the Danish government, and uh, he was accused, you know, from business, not from people who say you are challenging our standard of living and so on, but for business. And even the United States made an intervention in Kyoto uh, to try to stop him uh, for making disturbing business. So uh, I think that has been part of this year the whole time. And uh, I would like to hear your, uh, <coughs> your, your, how you see on the, what's happening just now, because we have been shouting to well, my children's generation, they didn't do nothing but a little bit, you know, wait in the eyes and a little bit scared, but nothing happened. Now they're, my grandchildren are at the streets. And I think uh, that is, uh, and I think we should do everything we can. That it didn't, you know, those who say you should stay at school, you know, shouldn't run out at them, you know, take your, care of your school. And I think that my grandchildren were really close to well, they are well, well educated, so they are not really tough, but they should be. But uh, how could your scientists, all those who have this big knowledge, support these young people now? Because they need, you know, they need all the encouragement they can get, because I think they are really now uh, having the impact 
so that uh, uh, politicians, we, can see, you know, we have now the opportunity. We have known this for a long, long time, but we have been catching the same. Uh, well, we have to be realistic, we have to be more, you know, all this kind of language which we have been hearing for 30 years now. And uh, uh, I think it would be very helpful if, if uh, all those who have been dealing with it from scientific basis could help the young people to, you know, to, to, to uh, uh, strengthen their impact to help us to get uh, things to move now, because now, you know, we have been saying time is running out. We have been saying that now for 30 years. Now it probably is running out. Thank you very much. Thank you, Margaret. Uh, Madame Valina. Muchas gracias, muchas gracias. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to the rapporteurs who have spoken. I always ask when there's a debate on this subject. In 2017, we all know we have the figures. 207 activists were assassinated for uh, fighting uh, the interests that uh, are benefiting from the destruction of the environment. But let me, there is also an issue whenever uh, we speak of this, and that's that we talk about the destruction of the environment. And that's the weapons industry that has never absolutely been mentioned. Uh, what, there was the, uh, it, it opposed the um, nuclear agreement uh, with uh, Iran, and at the same time, it was investing billions of dollars tr and trillions of dollars to make new uh, atomic bombs to make the world safer, as they claimed. Nor is there any discussion of the ongoing wars in Syria, in Yemen, in Iraq, in Afghanistan, in Libya that have destroyed the life of more than 150 million people nor do we ever discuss the fatal pollution of the habitats that the, uh, where pa Palestinians are living, who, besides being uh, bombed almost every day by Israel, they also are suffering an ecological catastrophe. Uh, fruit orchards and uh, farms have been destroyed. Their inhabitants are uh, breathing the asbestos of the houses destroyed by bombs. Residual uh, waters are... Uh, uh, polluting the Mediterranean because the infrastructure has been destroyed. And we have seen how the United States is, uh, is um, issuing, a, is emitting huge amounts of greenhouse effect gases. And there are more than 500,000 children who are missing limbs or uh, blind or uh, suffering from other disabilities due to war. Well, we need to keep in mind that wars produce a huge displacements of populations and the ero erosion of the soil. They uh, p pollute forests and water. In the Iraq war, following the uh, burning of 736 uh, petroleum wells, the, the oil refineries and oil fields, which kept burning for months, were also bombed, which produced millions of tons of carbon dioxide, sulfur, and mercury, relating to acid rain and consequences on uh, the vegetation and fauna and on human life as well. We also need to remi remember the use of 320 tons of uh, depleted uranium, which was used by the United States, which killed thousands of people and produced uh, strange illnesses and uh, malformations in uh, babies born later, besides uh, polluting uh, hectares of cultivated land. and. In the year 2015, the highest temperature in the history of the world was uh, uh, recorded due to the erosion in the water layer and uh, erosion of vegetation. And uh, armies, uh, the, the army of Myanmar is using the scorched earth policy against the Rohingya as well. I think that the environmental movement and all those who uh, are uh, engaged in making regulations on these issues should keep into consideration that the environmental uh, movement should be added, uh, as should the uh, movement for peace. And to, uh, no uh, manufacturer of weapons or of other uh, dangerous substances is ever going to um, give up on their benefits. And this is something that's always missing in all the reports. We, 
we go uh, we overlook this while this is a huge uh, cause of the destruction of the environment thank you but uh, taking into consideration the last two interventions i would suggest you first to be shorter so that more people will have time to uh, raise issues secondly to ask a question not to make a statement because this will be uh, relevant since we have a hearing with experts now uh, mr gerbrandi Yes, um, thank you, Madam Chair, and, and many thanks to both Professor uh, van uh, Ipersle and, and Mr. Carius for their clean oversight. Um, I'm, I'm afraid I recognized, I'm, I'm sitting quite close, I'm, I'm afraid I recognized a lot of what was on your um, uh, PowerPoint, and my question is, is not about the analysis of what's happening uh, with climate denial, but more what we could do against it and I've, I've seen in your presentations that you're struggling with that as well. I, I see the whole climate denial as a sort of um, coalition of on the one side lobbyists who are fighting for certain vested interests primarily in, in the fossil fuel um, uh, industry and politicians who abuse um, that work of the lobbyists in order to gain public support for their position and quite often I have the feeling that they don't believe what they're saying themselves but they they see political gain here um, what strikes me is that even people who are confronted with the effects of climate change on a daily basis like farmers quite often say that they don't believe it's because of climate change they, they see it happening, they see the seasons changing, they see more drafts, more heavy rain, but still they, they don't seem to make the connection to, to climate change. So my, my question is how, how, because this is not about politics or, or about rationale, this, this is about emotions and maybe even more about psychology. It's, it's much easier for people to believe that there is no such a thing as climate change than to be confronted with this enormous uh, thing on, on our climate. Um, so my question is, is maybe quite general, but how do you believe we can fight um, the unsustained denial of climate change, not in a rational way, but in a more emotional way? Uh, focusing on psychology and not just confronting denials again with the facts that we all know are the truth. Yes, uh, okay. It's a difficult question and a general one, but I, I think it's the key question. Thank you. Please uh, continue. Use less time, please. Mr. Hausling. Hausling. Yeah, if, if you know. Thank you very much for the presentation. 30 years we've known this, 30 years, I don't know, it's not so much that it's been badly tackled, I think it's been ignored by politics, barring a miracle, I don't know, ignoring it, ignoring the climate is almost as bad as confusing the climate as you, as you said earlier on, or denying climate change. I mean, I have one hope, last weekend we had millions of young people, the young generation throughout the world taking to the streets and saying, you're, you're selling our future down, down the line. You're gambling with our future. When have we ever seen that, that kind of global movement? I very much hope that that will be an incentive for politicians. You know, we can't afford to ignore this any longer, absolutely not. That said, we can see, even here in Europe, we don't need to look that far, uh, that far away. There are governments that are really going in a different direction. It's not just Bolsonaro or, or you know other leaders of other countries from outside Europe. It's actually here within Europe where you've got climate confusers. So you've got all these different trends going on. Bolsonaro and Trump met yesterday, of course, as you know, and they seemed quite happy because you've got two big countries here governed by these politicians who are climate deniers and climate confusers and it's disastrous. Now, coming back to the role of Europe more specifically, the Katowice conference, you'll see or you'll have seen that verbally speaking at least Europe was in the lead and, and we've taken the lead on this issue, that's fine, but the targets that we have set ourselves 
the European Commission and the Member States, you know, it's not enough. We know that it's not enough. So I'm wondering, do we stand a chance? Is this realistic if Europe gets going with this? Can we be in the lead, stay in the lead, and then really reach our targets by 2050? We've wasted 30 years already. Can we be optimistic about the future? Can we be confident that we will have a CO2-free policy in the, in the future, within the next few decades? Is that feasible? I'd like to ask that because for us as politicians, it becomes harder and harder to say we keep, we're keeping the flame of hope alive. I'd like to have some hope. So hence my question to you. Madam Aguera Garcia. And buenos dias. Good morning. I would in particular like to uh, thank uh, the speakers and the experts for intervening and uh, for having uh, presented to us something that, as I already said to a colleague, that is known to us. And uh, obviously, the majority of society does know, but uh, we uh, need to take the appropriate suitable measures to deal with this. I think that uh, here too, there are uh, people who share responsibility. We as politicians do share some uh, responsibility and uh, more than uh, citizens, clearly. I would like to ask you something specific because it is a fact that uh, Anyone in any national government who takes a position, knowing these uh, data, uh, know all this uh, and the measures are necessary, all this is known. The data is the data are there. Some people may want to deny this, but uh, usually, more often, they take a strategic uh, position or a position concerning employment or the. Um, uh, support for industry, but there is no clear way, there's nothing clear, no clear psychological way to understand why the most advanced societies, which supposedly have a higher level of education and training, are more sensitive to this, while people that is, okay, somebody who is hungry on a regular basis or has infrequent work, still knows that uh, some decisions uh, need to be made when uh, there's the state, the governments forget them. So, I know that uh, it has a lot of merit that now young people are very sensitive and that they are uh, really raising the uh, alarm before those who are responsible for making decisions because otherwise we're not going to have a future. But I don't know whether we are all ready to make real efforts in our own lives in uh, our comfort in, for instance, not using all the heat uh, and everything that gives us quality of life. I'm not sure where at the moment of truth we're really ready to go without a comfortable standard of living in order to make these uh, decisions, each one of us personally. I need to, I'd like to know what your impression of this is. Very much. I was trying hard not to use the hammer, so just to try to flag to you that when you are speaking too long. Mr. Brennan, I'm sure you won't, so... Um, from, from the Socialist Group, can I ask a, a question? Um, it seems to me there's um, a parallel here with how the tobacco industry fought back against the growing medical evidence that their products cause cancer. Um, is that a, a fair comparison to make? And what do we learn from the experience of... The, the battle against the, the um, tobacco companies that we could use um, in this situation. Thanks. Thank you very much, Mr. Brennan. Madam Boylan. Thank you. Um, I'll, I'll keep it brief because I, I actually want to just ask particular questions because I think that we can paint the picture of climate change, believer versus denier, but what we're seeing now is the how climate change denying forces like Exxon are morphing into climate delaying tactics um, and their tactics that are, are working. Um, so we know that ExxonMobil and other key polluters have gone from funding climate denial to pumping money into lobbying for carbon pricing and an emphasis on gas as a bridging fuel, all of which allows them to continue to extract fossil fuels. So the first question is, do the speakers support the call for the lobby badges of Ex ExxonMobil being revoked, given that we know that they have uh, been so active in climate denial? 
And the second question, how can we shift the focus to tackling carbon emissions from the current model that we have, which is clearly failing, to one of regulation that sets a clear date for the phase out of fossil fuels? Um, well, of course, it's more complicated than the ozone layer, but surely we need a similar approach to, to climate change. And then the third question, I suppose, is just to Mr. Van Ipsley um, on the social media aspect, because we've seen the harm that social media has done around vaccination as well. And I'd just really like if you could elaborate a little bit more on the point of, of what would you see the EU do in terms of tackling the social media aspect of it? So would you like to see a breaking up of some of the social media giants um, and a, a very strict regulatory approach taken to it? Thank you. Thank you very much. I think uh, the badges issue is something to raise with the, uh, with the House, since the experts are not members of the Bureau of the Parliament. Madame Evi. Thank you, Chair. I would just like to ask a question concerning the uh, evident um, push being made by the industrial sector and some lobbies. Uh, in particular, the petroleum, uh, gasoline, and uh, natural, natural gas and, uh, and coal uh, lobbies to make uh, environmental policies weaker at the world-wide uh, level. I think that uh, the idea of using a system of exchanges uh, on the financial market uh, in order to deal with, with uh, carbon uh, emissions, carbon dioxide emissions, because that is truly the uh, original sin that uh, we continue to find ourselves uh, immersed in because uh, we are still uh, following this path, uh, either unless we decide that this path was mistaken. However, this uh, path was undertaken uh, by the um, Kyoto Protocol, as was mentioned earlier. So that's a sort of original sin in which, uh, obviously, industries and lobbies of this type have uh, tried to uh, develop an a significant role in defining this uh, tool as a key for climate change. So this is my question now. Even with these uh, international consensuses, such as the Intergovernmental uh, Conference on Climate Change, and the which uh, you have been a part of, Professor, don't you think that the presence of these in industries and uh, of these lobbies are in fact hindering the achievement of concrete results? So do we have to have science that is independent Okay, thank you all for questions. Now uh, I will ask the two experts and to answer, if possible, or to make comments, but inside of, let's say, three minutes each. Mr. Ypersela. Well, that's a, that's a big challenge um, to, to, to do it in less than three minutes, but I will try. <laughs> um, I may not answer every aspect of every um, question or statement, though, if um, I have to be very short. But um, uh, f an answer to, to, to several of the questions is about the, um, the, the hope that remains. I mean, the IPCC has been very clear in its last report, the 1.5 special report, uh, 1.5 degree special report, that um, geophysically, it was not impossible to stay under 1.5 degrees C, and that with the measures, with the techniques, with the uh, policies, uh, with the changes in behavior that we know could reduce emissions to the extent needed, it would be, on paper, on the IPCC report paper, possible to stay below 1.5 degrees C warming. What's clearly missing, and I sometimes uh, say that it's written with invisible ink in IPCC report, is the political will to um, implement all those measures uh, uh, that would uh, allow for that. And this is what the uh, climate confusers are uh, helping to do, is to, to uh, undermine the political will. Because, of course, if you are not convinced uh, either that there is a problem to solve, a big problem to solve, but if you're not convinced either that the solutions are at hand, uh, available, uh, uh, even offering opportunities to uh, solve other problems among the uh, Sustainable Development Goals, for example, then you will not act sufficiently quickly. Um, 
I think that um, about what we can do about, that's an important question. I think that improving transparency uh, about uh, efforts uh, to sow doubts and funding those efforts would be important, you know? We know that uh, it's more than $900 million, almost a billion dollar per year that is um, available uh, for that kind of uh, climate confusing activities in the US because in the US there's a Freedom of Information Act that allows journalists and academics uh, to have access to those data. I'm not sure, but maybe Dr. Supran will uh, tell us more about that, that we have the same access to the same kind of information in the EU. So maybe there's uh, some work to do there. Uh, it's the same about uh, the rules for campaign fin financing uh, for policymakers. Uh, I think transparency about the money uh, coming and flowing uh, to some campaign financing from those lobbies would certainly uh, help. Um, social networks, um, well, I. I, it's not my role to, to say how to handle them, but uh, I just heard this morning on the radio, and uh, I think it was inspiring, that uh, a U.S. representative uh, yesterday or a few days ago wrote a letter to uh, uh, the, the big uh, GAFA companies uh, to highlight uh, their responsibility around the anti-vax movement the vaccination movement, anti-vaccination movement. And this had a, apparently a very quick effect. I mean, uh, both uh, Google, YouTube, etc., decided to demonetize, so to dissociate uh, those uh, many uh, YouTube um, sessions about uh, the anti-vax movement, to dissociate them from uh, advertisement revenue. So there are possibilities. They did it on a voluntary basis, just following a letter from, if I understood well, what I heard on the radio this morning, a U.S. representative, a U.S. member of Congress or Senate, maybe, I don't know. So why not the same here? And maybe some more regulation uh, could come as well uh, in that direction. Because I think the comparison can be made. I mean, we're working with the, the health of everything that's living on this planet and the comparison with health, human health, I think is very relevant. And to talk about the question on, on tobacco and the parallel with tobacco, I think Dr. Supran will, will uh, discuss that more uh, specifically. So I didn't answer uh, every um, aspect of the questions, but um, maybe the key ones, and I'm sure my colleague will also answer some of them. Thank, thank you, you very much, attention. Mr. Priscilla. Mr. Carrios. Please. Yeah, thank you. I will try my best. Uh, first of all, I was asked to talk about analysis. Uh, there are many recommendations in the report, so I recommend to have a look at that. I would like to make four uh, arguments. Uh, one is uh, from our Danish colleague, this argument, I liked it very much, too, about safeguarding and political will. Um, so I think one of the mistakes that we make is co really concentrating too much on climate skeptics and climate confusers there. Uh, because w what is worse, if you ignore the climate facts or if you acknowledge the climate facts and you, you don't act politically on that? And I mean, that is basically the case. There's the argument around there is no something like climate policy because otherwise we would have improved our, um, um, our current situation over the past two to three decades. Um, so I think, and that is my basic argument to say, and it has to do with uh, the question on can we turn this into something more emotional to say, the entire discourse by climate skeptic parties is basically framed as something that is affecting um, uh, certain parts of society and the economy. So it's very much about the cost argument. Why is, and what we do, is basically that we embark on something that we call transformative change and basically change everything in terms of how we produce, consume, move, and basically how we do our built environment. So the narrative would be a modernization narrative, a competitive narrative, a narrative about health, a narrative about uh, Im improvement of agricultural production, uh, about safety of products, of agricultural uh, products, etc. So, and more generally about the quality of life. And so in this equation, then you have to put the cost argument. I mean, the costs of, uh, associated to, to, to climate risk in 2017, just for the EU, were estimated at 283 billion euro. That is more 
uh, of the entire GDP of some of the EU member states. So cost is one thing, but at least I think that would be a convincing argument for uh, the quoted um, um, uh, person working in the agricultural sector. Uh, the second argument is <clears throat> that I think, and I would recommend, to change also communication on climate, ch uh, climate science. I mean, climate science is something very abstract. It's very complex. It's some, for, for many people, very different, uh, difficult to understand. So, uh, and I, I do observe now, um, since the past couple of years, particularly with uh, the, 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 the growing impact that climate denialists have on, on politics, is that they think about how we better communicate than our, the scientific results to an ordinary audience there. Um, and that can be built through many things. I mean, the way you design research. Um, so be it more applicable, be it more transparent. Um, if you develop the questions you would like to address from a scientific perspective, uh, whether you involve people to just uh, double check whether these are the questions that these people have. And that leads me to my third argument about um, uh, Fridays for Future, which is, um, I think, a very interesting um, uh, phenomena at the moment and really creates a lot of both pressure but also hope um, that um, I think uh, we need from a climate science perspective to inform students because there are also forces that now start spreading false information, particularly to young people. So I think that has to lead to a collision among the scientists for future with the students for future. There are already attempts by larger climate science um, um, institutions in, in doing so. The second thing I think a crucial uh, aspect is media. We have to sensitize and also critically watch media, what kind of information they are picking up. So if we say within the IPCC there is a consensus of 97%, if you, if you check media whether they are covering that, no, they don't. They jump on every single and silly argument that somebody has put forward to question and just say, it is my belief. So basically framing it not as a scientific fact, but something where you can take uh, legitimately a, another position. And I think uh, that, is, that is very important. And uh, the third, very concretely, I mean, I, I, I'm admired by the protests of students. Is the, science, the educational system ready to absorb that? My answer is no. Uh, if, you, if you see how teachers are dealing with that, how strict our educational programs are, uh, they basically insist on, 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 on students coming back to school because that's their duty. Uh, but they're very uninspirational there. My fourth argument and last argument is basically just to, to pick up the question of uh, weapons of mass destruction, etc., cetera, and, and, and basically the military sector. Uh, I think there is another argument, particularly here uh, in, in Brussels, and that's about climate diplomacy. And think about what kind of of, of knock-on effects, long-term effects, uh, climate crisis and climate risks can have um, on, on the fragility and destabilization of countries. Uh, you might be familiar with the case of Syria, that it was argued basically that the origin of the Syrian crisis and the civil war was a five years consecutive drought that then pushed and were very complex uh, knock-on effects that emerged from there. I don't have the time to explain to that. But basically, Mrs. Mogherini held a conference last June here in Brussels on climate, uh, peace and security. And I think um, we have to embed this into uh, the European European foreign policy, and there is a lot of things to follow up on that. Thank you. Thank you very much to both of you for a very nice introductory. Uh, I just want to say, because here stops uh, the contribution of the Environment Committee to this hearing, I would like just to say that I don't want the audience to remain with the impression that nothing was done. This Parliament uh, done a tremendous work in putting forward legislation in various sectors, trying to fight climate change. We are very much involved with the climate diplomacy. We have been present and we have uh, people here working very hard on these topics, with um, bringing people after them, moving things forward. We have the European Commission who has done a lot, of course, it, maybe it's not enough, and I'm sure the, um, the work will continue with the next parliament. But uh, enormous steps were taken, and I want to recognize the contribution of my colleagues uh, in this work in the last uh, uh, past years, and I'm sure we can encourage the colleagues from the next parliament to take where we are and go move it even further. So thank you very much for you, and now I'm passing the floor to my um, uh, uh, petty, um, petitions committee. 
uh, colleague to continue the hearing, please. Yes, thank you very much. We continue with the second panel. First of all, I welcome our distinguished panelists, but before I give the floor to you, gentlemen, I welcome also the petitioner. Where is sitting the author of the petition? That's the lady there. Welcome, madam. The floor is yours uh, for five minutes presentation, please. Thank you, Chair. Almost three years ago, when the Exxon News scandal about Exxon Mobil's climate change denial campaign had reached its peak in the US, I submitted a petition for my NGO, Food and Water Europe, supported by hundreds of European citizens. We asked the EU Parliament to act and find ways to hold Exxon accountable for its lies here in Europe. Thanks to the support of a number of MEPs, we are now here to discuss an issue that is connected to both the fossil fuel industry and the survival of, of humankind, global warming. Exxon has been invited to speak at this hearing, allowing the world to watch MEPs scrutinize one of the biggest polluters worldwide. But Exxon refused the invitation. This is a scandal given that Exxon lied to us for 40, 50 years, knowing that its fossil fuel activities were contributing to climate change. This is a scandal given that all of us who will be affected by global warming deserve answers and immediate actions to combat climate change now. Exxon's refusal to attend is a scandal. It shows that Exxon disrespects democracy, while hundreds of thousands of young people, millions in fact, march on the streets, asking decision makers to protect nothing else than their future. This is a scandal in a moment in which there is a huge movement for a binding international treaty to hold transnational corporations accountable that has been supported by the European Parliament. This is a particular scandal that the multinational is not here today because we know that Exxon has direct access to this very building and uses its six lobby badges and several others indirectly to do so. But interestingly, not today. Exxon pays millions and millions to consultancies and lobbyists to influence EU decision makers. The sum amounted to over 35 million euros during the last nine years alone to water down climate laws and spread false solutions. And despite claiming the opposite, Exxon still funds groups who spread doubts about the reality of climate change and its direct links to the coal, oil and gas industry. Something is gravely wrong here. In times when we know that the last five years, 2014, 2015, 2016, 2017 and 2018 have been the hottest ever measured, it is unacceptable that Exxon literally, and this is not an exaggeration, sits at the negotiation table and helps draft EU and energy and climate policies. It is even invited to do so. It is unacceptable that they are right inside the process of drafting and pre-writing climate laws while the young people outside demand nothing more existential than laws to keep the planet within livable conditions. Exxon's activities are inherently harmful to the planet and its vested financial interests are by default incompatible with any useful climate law. Urgently needed climate action is not possible with Exxon's continued influence. It is not possible with any big fossil fuel corporation's influence. Here are some of our demands and how the European Parliament and how the European institutions can move forward. An easy and very first necessary first step is to strip Exxon of its lobby badges. The corporation does not cooperate with the Parliament as it should and breaches the code of conduct by providing misleading information. Exxon should not be able to participate in events that are held on EU Parliament or com Commission premises. Any interaction between Exxon and parliamentarians, their staff and Commission officials has to be limited to a minimum. Exxon lobbyists should not have a seat in Commission expert groups anymore. Close the revolving door between Exxon and the Commission officials too. It is possible with courageous, independent decision makers who act in the interest of civil society and withstand the interests of big oil and gas companies whose interests can no longer be prioritized as we move closer to catastrophic climate change. There are ways of changing the huge disproportion of fossil fuel interests so that we start putting the interests of civil society first. The many paths of influence that Exxon and other fossil fuel corporations enjoy today need to be blocked one by one, starting with the lobby badges now. Thank you.
Thank you very much. And now I welcome our first panelist. Uh, he is Mr. Uh, Geoffrey Supran, a researcher at uh, Harvard University, who is a co-author of the Environmental Research Letter Assessing Exxon Mobil's Climate Change Communications from 1977 to 2014. So the floor is yours for about 12 minutes, please. Thank you for having me here today uh, to speak to you about ExxonMobil's climate change communications. Uh, as many of you know, ExxonMobil is under scrutiny on several legal fronts. Uh, from investigations by the Attorneys General of New York and Massachusetts to lawsuits by cities and states, uh, indeed to this hearing, a common question has emerged. Have communications about climate change by ExxonMobil and other fossil fuel companies misled customers, shareholders, or the general public, including in ways that may have broken the law? This is the key guiding question of my testimony today. In order to approach this question, I begin by contextualizing my research on a broader timeline of climate denial shown here running from the 1940s to present. Our story begins in 1954, when the US Oil and Gas Industries Trade Association, the American Petroleum Institute, or API, became aware that fossil fuel burning had already increased CO2 in the atmosphere. Three years later, scientists at Humble Oil, now ExxonMobil, explicitly confirmed this finding. And two years after that, the heads of API were warned in detail in person by physicist Edward Teller about uh, global warming due to fossil fuel burning, quote, sufficient to melt the ice cap and submerge New York. This is important. 60 years ago, the oil industry knew that its products were potentially dangerous. And this knowledge continued to grow. Through the 60s and 70s, API commissioned multiple reports, for example, one warming of almost certain warming by 2000, with potential melting of the ice cap and sea level rise. At one of API's member companies in particular, Exxon, scientists began briefing their executives. In a 1977 presentation entitled The Greenhouse Effect, Exxon scientist James Black warned that, quote, CO2 release is the most likely source of climate modification, and that, quote, doubling CO2 could increase temperature one to three Celsius by 2050. The following year, Exxon began assembling a credible scientific team to assess the possible impact of the greenhouse effect on Exxon business. Among those hired was university researcher Andrew Caligari, who by that point, quote, accepted that the temperature rise of two to three degrees for CO2 doubling is essentially correct. So to sum up, by the late 1970s, global warming was no longer speculative. The issue was not were we going to have a problem, the issue was simply how soon and how fast and how bad was it going to be, not if. <coughs> These are not my words, but those of a former Exxon scientist who was recently interviewed. This was a make or break moment for the fossil fuel industry. Shown here in its tiger stripe colors, Exxon was at a fork in the road. Would it continue to follow the science or would it attack it? ExxonMobil says any allegations of wrongdoing are false. Read the documents they challenged the public in 2015. Read all of these documents and make up your own mind. Professor Naomi Reskes and I took up this challenge. Over the course of a year, we read the documents and analyzed them according to established social science methods. This is the first ever peer-reviewed academic analysis of ExxonMobil's 40-year history of climate change communications. To begin our study on con of content analysis, we binned all of the documents into four categories. This yielded 37 internal company memos spanning 1977 to 95, as well as 72 peer-reviewed and 47 non-peer-reviewed articles from the 80s to present. The fourth category we looked at was so-called advertorials, paid editorial-style advertisements taken out by Mobile and then ExxonMobil on the op-ed page of the New York Times. And we then used a systematic coding scheme to characterize each document's positions on global warming as real and human cause. The result is a timeline of the overall positions of each document. So let's start with the internal memos. Each line here represents an individual document and is color coded. Blue for acknowledge, red for doubt, and gray for no position. We see that the bulk of Exxon's internal memos acknowledge uh, the basic realities of human-caused climate change. And this amounted to a cautious consensus consistent with mainstream science in the 80s. For example, this 1979, beg your pardon, for example, this 1979 internal Exxon study concluded that increasing CO2 concentration will cause a warming of the Earth's surface with dramatic environmental effects before 2050. In these 1982 and 84 graphs and tables, Exxon projected global warming due to fossil fuel burning consistent with mainstream science. 
Next, we see that Exxon's, Exxon Mobil's peer-reviewed and non-peer-reviewed publications also acknowledge climate change as real and human caused. The peer-reviewed ones, overwhelmingly so. For example, and this is perhaps the most obvious of examples, Exxon's principal climate scientist was a contributing author to the IPCC's famous 1995 uh, conclusion of a discernible human influence on global climate. He was also a co-author to the next IPCC's report, which found new and stronger evidence. Finally, turning to advertorials, we see that the predominant stance is doubt. Let's face it, this 1997 mobile advertorial stated, the science of climate change is too uncertain. Scientists cannot predict with certainty if temperatures will increase. We still don't know what role man-made greenhouse gases might play in warming the planet. Another example is this 2000 ExxonMobil advertorial entitled Unsettled Science. It argues that against the backdrop of large, poorly understood natural variability, it is impossible for scientists to attribute the recent small surface temperature increase to human causes. So to summarize, here are the fractions of all documents taking each position. Acknowledge is blue and doubt is red. Look at doubt in red. This is a statistically significant trend. The more public ExxonMobil's climate change communications are, the more they communicate doubt. Informed by a content analysis, we can now return to our guiding question, have Exxon's communications misled? In short, the answer is yes. ExxonMobil misled non-scientific audiences about climate science and its implications, and it did so in three ways. First, through direct discrepancies between its science and its advertorials. Post-ExxonMobil merger, for example, we found that roughly 80% of peer-reviewed articles acknowledged that climate change is real and human cause. Yet essentially the same fraction of advertorials promoted doubt on that same matter. In other words, they contributed quietly to the science, yet loudly to raising doubts about it. Of course, internal documents were completely confidential, and academic articles generally had readerships of just tens or hundreds of people. These are usually highly technical articles hidden behind paywalls. In contrast, Mobil and ExxonMobil bought New York Times advertorials specifically, quote, to let the public know where we stand. They had millions of readers, and psychologists have found that an Exxon advertorial substantially affects individual issue salience. The second way the company misled was with misinforming public communications inconsistent with mainstream science. For example, this 2000 advertorial presented temperatures in the Sargasso Sea in a way that implied historical variability for the entire planet. The scientist who had produced the data complained to the company about its very misleading use of his work. This 1998 uh, Exxon pamphlet stated that the IPCC's discernible <coughs> human influence conclusion was, quote, not peer-reviewed. This claim was false. As we've seen, Exxon's chief climate researcher was a contributing author to that very IPCC conclusion. The third way ExxonMobil misled is by funding and orchestrating additional climate denial inconsistent with what the company knew. As one of Exxon's main research collaborators uh, back in the 80s put it in a recent interview, even though we were writing all of these papers supporting human-caused climate change, the front office of the company was also supporting climate deniers, giving millions of dollars to other entities to support the idea that CO2 greenhouse was a hoax. Exxon's climate denial got so bad that in 2006, Great Britain's Royal Society, the oldest scientific institution in the world, wrote urging them to cease and desist. As we will see, they did not. Specifically, as my colleagues and I described in this report, ExxonMobil's past and present climate denial has taken four forms. First, the company has directly uh, communicated denial, and we show this as another arrow on our timeline. For example, in 2000, CEO Lee Raymond used a petition supposedly signed by scientists to argue that, quote, there is no convincing scientific evidence of human-caused global warming. The petition signatories included Star Wars characters and a Spice Girl. Two years later, he said, we in Exxon do not believe the science and many scientists agree. This directly contradicted the IPCC. ExxonMobil has also denied climate science by funding contrarian scientists. For example, astrophysicist Willie Soon published academic articles in exchange for one and a quarter million dollars from fossil fuel companies, including $300,000 from ExxonMobil over five years, during which he repeatedly em emphasized the flawed notion of CO2-driven climate change and claimed, quote, too much ice is really bad for polar bears. Soon his false claims became a champion of climate deniers in Congress and media. Exxon has also used third-party organizations 
giving $39 million to these 73 climate-denying organizations. And this doesn't even include money to public relations firms and advertising groups. As just one example, Exxon was a member of the Global Climate Coalition, which told lawmakers and journalists through the 90s that, quote, the role of greenhouse gases in climate change is not well understood. GCC spent $13 million campaigning against the Kyoto Climate Protocol and was so successful that the White House told them President Bush rejected Kyoto in part based on input from you. Fourthly, ExxonMobil continues to fund climate-denying politicians. As just one example, Senator Jim Inhofe denies, describes global warming as the greatest hoax ever perpetrated on the American people. Inhofe has taken $57,000 from ExxonMobil, including in 2015, the same year he tried to refute record temperatures by producing a snowball on the Senate floor. Not only has ExxonMobil denied that climate change is real and human caused, our analysis also shows that they misled about it being serious and solvable. On the one hand, for instance, this 1979 internal memo warned that doubling CO2 could raise oceans four feet, melt the ice caps, and cause major shifts in weather patterns. Yet on the other hand, 21 years later, this advertorial stated, just as changeable as your local weather forecast, views on the climate debate range from seeing the issue as serious or trivial. We've also found that whereas not one advertorial alludes to the risks of stranded fossil fuel assets, 24 of their less public documents do so. This 1982 internal memo warned that climate mitigation, quote, would require major reductions in fossil fuel combustion. In fact, Exxon has even quantified the carbon budget consistent with less than two degrees warming, arriving at very similar values to today's best estimates. Once again, the evidence shows that ExxonMobil has misled, in this case about climate change as serious and solvable, and about the risks of stranded assets. None of this was an accident. Internal documents reveal that at that critical moment 40 years ago, Exxon devised two parallel approaches, climate science research and a PR campaign. On the one hand, Exxon had a handful of scientists continue legitimate research, and we represent this with the left arrow. This allowed them to maintain awareness of science and policy and make informed business decisions. <coughs> Meanwhile, however, the research also offered, quote, great public relations value. In 1980, Exxon developed a CO2 communications plan targeting, quote, opinion leaders who are not scientists. And by 1988, the plan was explicit. To extend the science and, quote, emphasize the uncertainty in scientific conclusions regarding the potentially enhanced greenhouse effect. Or, as another industry memo put it, victory will be achieved when average citizens and the media recognize uncertainties in climate science. The plan's architects were Exxon, Chevron, API, utilities companies, and numerous front groups funded by fossil fuel companies, tobacco companies, and libertarian billionaires. The coal and utilities industry strategy was even blunter. Reposition global warming as theory, not fact. So before I close, there are two important perspectives I'd like you to come away with. First, big oil is the new big tobacco. In every way, strategy, tactics, infrastructure, rhetoric, the fossil fuel industry's denial and delay come straight out of big tobacco's playbook. Second, I have only shown you the tip of the iceberg, one cog in a well-funded, well-oiled climate denial machine, a labyrinth of people and money connecting fossil fuel companies, foundations, think tanks, PR firms, front groups, all feeding an echo chamber of astroturfs, politicians, media, and blogs. Yale's Justin Farrell, in fact, has identified at least 4,000 individuals and 160 organizations in this global machine. So in other words, the web of denial is not limited to America, but has been pushed to other countries, including Europe. As just one example of how climate denial in Europe is supported by this network, take this 2010 report by a Spanish academic, which claimed that every green job in Spain destroyed 2.2 other jobs. This complete falsehood became a favorite talking point of climate denying media and politicians, and it was the web of denial in action. Let's see how. Exxon, API, and the Cokes funded the Institute for Energy Research, which commissioned the author to write the report. Also, the UK-based International Policy Network, which fun funded the Centre for New Europe, which funded the report. Also, Exxon and the Cokes financed the Atlas Network, which funded Instituto Juan de Mariana, which belonged, of course, to the author. 
So what has been the impact of all of this? Well, network analysis shows that Exxon and the Cokes have created a so-called ecosystem of influence on our public and politicians. Exxon funding has increased the quantity and volume of denial, its influence on denialist rhetoric, and its polarization of American opinion. In turn, as one study puts it, climate denial has made the US an impediment to international policymaking. And there is no clearer example of this than President Trump's attempt to withdraw from the Paris Agreement. In Europe, in Europe the ecosystem of influence is generally less blatant, but it exists. In the UK, for example, political scientists concluded that denial and skepticism have achieved political traction, creating a fog of distrust instrumental in draining political capital from climate policymaking. However, the most pernicious impact of climate denial may be that it mutually reinforces populist anti-regulatory ideologies. First, profit and libertarianism drive fossil fuel interests and conservative billionaires to fund anti-science, anti-policy denial. This, in turn, ferments public distrust in science, media, and government, which then reinforces the populist ideologies, and a vicious cycle ensues. Unsurprisingly, therefore, scholars and journalists have uncovered deep ties between climate denying entities and the Tea Party, the UK Independence Party, and the right wing of the Brexit campaign. So with that, I close by noting that our results do not stand in isolation. It is the overwhelming consensus of experts studying the history of fossil fuel interest based on thousands of pages of documented evidence that fossil fuel companies and trade associations, including ExxonMobil, have variously orchestrated, funded, and perpetuated climate change misinformation. The historical record is incontrovertible, and to my knowledge has never been challenged by ExxonMobil. In parallel, there is also overwhelming evidence that many of these companies and associations have variously known about the basics of human-caused climate change for 60 years. Put together, this evidence points only one way. Fossil fuel companies and trade associations, including ExxonMobil, have variously promoted disinformation about climate change so as to stifle action by misleading our public and politicians. Unfortunately, they have largely succeeded. Thank you very much, and I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. And now I welcome Mr. Uh, Georgi Stefanov. He's, a, he's the chief climate and energy expert, climate change and uh, green economy program manager from WWF uh, Bulgaria. So the floor is yours for 10 to 12 minutes, please. Can I have my presentation, please? So, uh, dear Mr. Chasky, uh, Vice Chair of the Petition Committee, dear guests, uh, thank you for being here. Uh, shortly, who I am, I live in Sofia in Bulgaria with my two children and my life. I'm 100% environmentalist dealing with climate and energy. Usually, the last 20 years, 11 of them at WWA Bulgaria. I'm part-time lecturer at the New Bulgarian University and founder of the Bulgarian Climate Action Coalition and the Bulgarian Greens. I'm also an uh, agriculture and beekeeper. So I will talk about today about uh, useful communication and campaign techniques tackling climate change denial based on my NGO experience. I will mention about some principles, clarification, and conclusions, which are really connected to the previous presentation of the uh, colleagues beh uh, under, uh, before me. So, you know, the opinion on climate change is divided not because of the unavailability of proper information, but mostly because of the way of available information is incorrectly analyzed and mispresented to the public. Communication with the vast majority of people who range from being dismissive to indifferent or undecided about an issue like climate change sure isn't an easy activity. So, starting with my real part of the presentation, I will start with a very simple question. Why are there no good movies about climate change with happy ends? The answer of this simple question really gives us uh, what stands behind the climate change denial. Communicating and campaigning about a phenomenon like climate change, which by nature is complex in a simple language, is a process that full with several challenges. 
It's getting more challenging when we have climate change denial approach on purpose. The most important aspects of climate change issue, ideas and policy measures are lost in the noise created by confusion resulting from the lack of proper understanding of what climate change is really about. So, why campaigns are crucial to tackle climate change denial? First, this is directional activity designed to achieve a particular purpose. This is not education, not advocacy, lobbying or peripheral communication activity. This is attract a wider public. Uh, this is aimed to catalyze significant, significant change to the public benefit to go beyond business and usual. Campaigns strive to make the impossible possible to provide a channel for the expression of public with sufficient force to cause change beyond that, which would result from the process or business as usual. Second, uh, campaigns are crucial because it's a form of public politics. This is a way of getting things done, convert values into action, and exist where the commercial market and formal politics fail to convert values into action. Powerful people like politicians, climate change deniers, influential businessmen tend not to like ch climate change campaigns because they are often seen as a real hurt to and in a competition with the formal politics. They challenge the power and the status quo. Powerful people also tend not to run campaigns because they don't have to. They are already in power and is their frame that is the official truth. Campaigns tackling climate change in our campaigns to create change. They are not the same as advertising, fundraising, PR campaigns, or, or election campaigns. We are talking about specific strategic campaigns here that challenge systematic and influential players that will be affected by individuals by turning the point of climate change denial. So the seven major principles of campaigning is, are be multidimensional, communicate in all dimensions of human understanding, engage by providing agency, be legitimized by more deficit, People must feel that there is a gap between what is currently happening and what should be done. Provoke a con conversation in society, meet a need, solve a problem. This is really important. Be strategic, be communicable. How do campaigns achieve change when we're talking about denial? First, through the con conversation with society which provides the motivation to act and the means to act. The motivation to act, expressing where society knows that something must be done urgently and asking for help. Only with you we can make a difference, only with you can the, the impossible become possible. It is a call of arms, an invitation to join an adventure. The means to act, engage with providing agency, providing the tools and mechanism for action. People must feel that they are they can contribute to part of the change, that without them we will fail. It is not enough to be expert in the fact of the matter, to understand the issue of climate change at its denial at hand. Campaigners need to understand how motivation works, how an issue needs to be framed to resonate with the audience, how it can meet their needs. So, why communication is very important? You basically see the answer of the picture. Right? This is just because we don't want to see our ch ch children's futures in their hands. You, we all know that communication is a two-way process, listening to others and expressing. Barriers to communication can lead to misunderstanding and conclusion. We've heard that in the previous presentation. But, the communication equation basically is what you heard, the tone of voice, the vocal clarity, the verbal expressiveness. Those are the 40% of the message. What, you're, what you see or feel 
facial expression, dress and drooming, posture, eye contact, touch, body language, those are the, the second biggest pieces of the communication, another 50%. And the words are the only 10% of the message. So effective communication skills used to change the climate change denial perspective are important. That could be some you know, encouragement to, to continue, silence, smiling face, body language, and many other things. But barriers to effective communication are something that we should not forget. And sometimes the barriers are really limited, like the time we have today, or the language, you know, challenge to me. Uh, the noise, other people who are talking when we are talking. Uh, too many questions, or not clear question, lack of interest, and etc. But, this is the real denial story the last two, three decades. We clearly saw with this. This is the big dragon that we're trying to fight with. Uh, but denials are getting weaker and more convinced already to change. And finally, we're gonna win. I really believe in this. And today's denial is more related to the question what will happen if the temperatures are increasing with more than 1.5 degrees. Uh, not just like 20, 30 years ago when actually the question was, is it really climate change caused by people? Deniers today, deniers to, today try to convince society that no matter how many degrees we will have more, the future will be better and people shouldn't worry about. But is it really like that? No, it's not. And this graph really just show what is the difference between 1.5 and 2 degrees global warming. So just to mention two examples, the extreme weather, the difference is 70%. People, if we get the, the two differences, in the first scenario, just maybe 10% of the, the, the global population will be affected. affected. The second one is almost one third. <clears throat> so before I'm finished, I just mentioned shortly the 15 principles of useful communication to tackle climate change denial. Start with what you know, not with what you don't know. That's a really important from our perspective. Be clear about the scientific consensus. Shift from insecurity to a risk. Most people right now are used to dealing with the idea of risk. It is a the language of the insurance, health, national security sector. So far, many audiences like politicians, business leaders, or the military talking about the risk of climate change is likely to be more effective than talking about the insecurities. So <clears throat> be clear about the type of risk you are talking about. This is very related to the previous one. Understand what is, the, what is driving people views. Connect with what matters to your audience. Communicate through images and story. Most people, most people understand the world through stories and images, not lists of numbers, probability statements, or technical graphs. And so here is crucial to find ways of translating and interpreting the technical language found in the scientific reports into something more engaging. Highlight the positiveness of insecurity. Communicate effectively about climate change impacts. Have a conversation, not an argument. Tell a human story. Most people really understand the world through anecdotes and story, rather than statistics and graphs. So aiming for a narrative structure and showing the human face behind the science when presenting information will help you tell the, exact, the exciting story. Communicating climate change, focus on solution. Usually there is some cause on optimism. When the messages focus on available solution, and this is positive message, people are really get interested. Be a confident communicator, manage your audience expectations. People express science to provide definitive answers, although in reality it's a method for asking questions about the world. So manage people's expectation and use plenty of analogies from everyday life so people can see that insecurity are everywhere, not just in climate science. 
talk about the real world, not abstract ideas, start your climate conversation on common ground using clear languages and examples your audience is more likely to be familiar with. with. Remind, remind, remind. If you're tell, trying to change habits, it's not good convincing someone just one. You need to remind them exactly when they are talking the action you want to change. And the top four reasons climate change deniers change their minds are really visible. Almost half of it is related about to learn more about science, risk of environmental damage is also crucial, erratic weather and climate change deniers lack of credibility. And with the today's here actually we are also touching the last point, the lack of credibility of climate change deniers. So another another important role of the NGOs are, you know, our slogan think globally and act locally, still very useful argument. Make your reports really influential and understandable. This is an example of our WWF report that we're presenting every second year, almost to the case already. And, you know, always be reliable, visible, game changer. Get trusted VIP like the bad guys does. Uh, because, you know, they really help to tackle climate change denial. They're always helpful. And after the Trump became president in the US, uh, our colleagues there actually start to form this, we are still in coalition. So form alliances and build trusted coalitions. So far, this is coalition in the US has more than uh, 3,500 signatories across all the states representing almost half of the millions of US. And when you have something big, you always have to look at and to propose something much bigger than the energy sector itself and their approach of denying climate change. Give the big piece to the top politicians so they have the reason and arguments to tackle climate change. And this is also example from our network that we just launched two months ago uh, our Global Deal for Nature and People campaign, which basically uh, is related with all the people around the world. Uh, and we are not trying to separate people. This is most relevant. We uh, usually don't underestimate the youths and talk about their future. This is possibility which is easy to be accepted by majority of people and climate deniers can't use their instruments to stop this. Also, get together, get your friends, colleagues, build alliances. This is the natural way to tackle denial. Sometimes even form unexpected partnerships. It's a confusing, but it's really helpful. And because climate change denial soon will be part of the history and no one will remember it, we definitely have to wake up and to understand that it's time for dealing with climate change. And as this smart guy says a long time ago, it takes a new way of thinking to solve the problems that we created by the old way of thinking. So we should not forget that solutions are around us. We just need to see how the nature does those things. We need not to forget that the humans are part of the nature of the earth and basically the solutions are there. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. So, <laughs> dear friends, we have now a very limited time, unfortunately, for the, for the dialogue. I have a request from uh, four of my colleagues, uh, Rebecca Weitz, Scott Gard Gardini. It's all. Thank you. Uh, two minutes for everybody. Sorry. Uh, Mr. Rebecca. Thank you, Chair. So, I would like, first of all, to, st to, to start with uh, some of... Uh, facts that many of us know that Mr. Sopran has been a, a very willing participant of a well-documented campaign to vilify a company that provides more than 40,000 jobs in Europe. The same company publicly advocate for President Trump to remain in the Paris Agreement. And I would like to, I would like to get back now to one of our panelists, Mr. Karius, who said being supportive with Paris Agreement means positive attitude. 
So we are trying to kill a company which are investing more than 10 billion in the last 15 years in Europe, which is having a positive attitude. Against the same company, similar claims have already been dismissed by U.S. authorities, I mean the SEC. Mr. Sopran, your methodologies were criticized by the very scholar whose work provided the framework for your study, rejected your claims for their lack of scientific support. Mr. Supran, you promised almost a year ago to prepare a peer review. Is it? To reboot this study. Have you published it? Is it peer-reviewed? Are you aware that before Exxon and Mobile merged in 1999, there were two separate companies and with no legal responsibility for each other's action? Isn't the majority of your documents from that period? In Romania, Exxon Mobile has completed an ambitious development campaign in the Black Sea, providing growth and employment opportunities, but at the same time giving both Romania and the European Union a chance to become important players in that area. So let's remember what the Commission concluded in 2017. I quote, the Commission does not plan to take action with regard to this issue raised by the petitioner. So thank you very much. Thank you. Madam Skolgar, please. Thank you very much. Thank you to Food and Water Europe for bringing this petition. Thank you, Mr. Supran, for your excellent work and your very interesting presentation. We're all aware in this parliament of how the lobby works. We can feel the weight of the lobby right here. We know that many of the politicians we work with are constantly working for industry, even when it's a destructive industry like oil and gas, even when it's an industry that's destroying the possibility for our children to have a future on this planet. Truth really matters. I think that's what we've learned from Mr. Supran today. And we're living in an era where various people are trying to manipulate and distort truth. And this process is in itself destroying our democracy. One of the most important things in a democracy is that we have a shared view of what the reality we're working with is. We can see that ExxonMobil have deliberately tried to undermine that. I think as responsible politicians, we all should be clear about which lobbyists we meet. And I know in the Green Group we do that, and I think others do as well. We have to be accountable for the decisions we make, and we have to be clear about where we're getting our information from. But we also need lobbyists to be accountable. It's totally unacceptable that ExxonMobil did not come to this panel today. If they're going to be part of our parliament, if they're going to be part of our decision-making process, then, they then we should be clear about what they're doing. And my own view is, if they're going to tell lies, then we should not allow them into the parliament. I don't think we should allow liars and people who provide disinformation that, that really undermines our possibility of having a human future on this planet into our decision-making processes. According to Rule 116 in the Rules of Procedure, lobbyists shall have their access badges denied when they have refused without offering a su sufficient justification to comply with a formal summons to attend a hearing or committee meeting or to cooperate with a committee of inquiry. I believe that this provides us with the grounds we need to withdraw Exxon's lobby badges and we will be writing to the questers later today, and I would recommend, I would really urge all other MEPs who care about the future of our climate to join us in signing that letter. Thank you. Thank you very much. Madam Gardini, please. Yes, thank you. I would like to ask whether you know you're in Brussels, that is, in the heart of the European institutions, where we are worldwide leaders in the fight against climate change. Maybe you think you're in Washington or in Beijing because uh, uh, I've... Do you have any su suggestions uh, about how, what Europe can do and what how we can improve? Uh, the fact is that we're such uh, leaders um, uh, as compared to how we're ahead we are of the rest of the world, we're almost isolated. So rather than as telling us what more we could do, couldn't, wouldn't it be better to focus on the United States and China and having them do what we're already doing? because it would really be difficult for us to do more. Now, as far as the petition concerns, it seems that the person who outlawed it said something rather strange. It's not against ExxonMobil, it's against all the oil and gas industry, as though being oil and gas were against the law. We're trying to regulate the transition, but for the moment, it's still part of the energy mix. Otherwise, we can act like in Venezuela, have a blackout, people die in hospitals, and... Uh, we're exposed to heat and cold and no fridges uh, and will die in uh, die poisoned. I think that I'm in the middle of an insane asylum. 
okay, it's true. There are petroleum companies uh, financing, but what about uh, Brunseller, which finances so much uh, energy? Well, they made their money out of petroleum, and I think they still own a lot of uh, a lot of uh, petroleum shares. So I don't think uh, Rockefeller turned into Mother Teresa of Calcutta all of a sudden. So let's uh, all show our cards. So let's see who was financed by whom, for what purpose, what interests exist. Some people have made their money out of oil, and now they're saying that the business is going to electricity. So let's uh, shift our focus. Come on. Nobody was born yesterday here. I see that there's a lot of uh, imbalance. So there's Exxon, and uh, we were told why. We could have Professor Nonedorf, who, who disputed Mr. Supran's, Professor Supran's uh, issue, because she created the methodology and said that it was applied badly. So I'd like to see a meeting from a meeting who's right and on which side is right and it seems that we're all we all agree there is climate change and we need to combat it but i repeat you're in the place where we're really doing the most where climate climate change is recognized and combated more than anywhere else maybe you think you're in the wrong area code good luck thank you mr Vice please thank you for sitting uh, thank you very much chairman Exxon Mobil has refused to attend this committee meeting to answer questions. Their excuse was that there are proceedings pending in the USA precisely relating to this issue, mis misinformation about climate. Now, if you know the US justice system, you know that you actually need quite a lot to convince someone to bring charges against one of the biggest corporations in the USA altogether. It's very bizarre that Exxon isn't here today. It's not opposite. But also, I think it's very extraordinary that members of this committee are actually lambasting the petitioner. The petitioner is talking about the next generation, our future. So lambasting the petitioner, what you're doing there is lambasting hundreds of thousands of young people who have taken to the streets demanding a better climate policy. We can look to the past, of course. ExxonMobil has sent us a letter saying they support the outcome of the Paris uh, Climate Conference. But how much money has since been invested by Exxon into this area since then? Renewable energies, what have they done about that? Could you please explain to us why it is that a company is still involved in the destruction of the future of our children, our grandchildren, at the same time claim that they understand the message coming out of the Paris Climate Conference. How is that tenable or credible? I think it's really awful that you're blambusting the petitioners once again. Thank you. One minute. Oh, very last. Muito presidente. É que nós estamos aqui de facto. Thank you, Chairman. We're here in the European Parliament, an institutional centre where we lead work on the clean energy package and we adopted energy governance and the 2030 plans to make Europe a leader in decarbonisation of the economy. We lead the world in terms of mo intelligent mobility and I cannot sit on my hands if people say, let's wait for the US, let's wait for China, they're behind us, wait for them to act. No, we have to create uh, jobs while saving the planet, while thinking of the people. Yesterday, um, a member of the European Parliament was at Bucharest at a meeting of the ACP Europe uh, delegation, and we gave our financial support uh, to rescue activities in Zimbabwe and Mozambique. Uh, think of that. We should not be so selfish. Well, if you wish reactions in two and two minutes, please. Very shortly, please, because... Two minutes? <laughs> two minutes. <laughs> um, so the, the, I'm sorry if I can't address everything. Um, the, the gentleman accuses us of being activists as though that's something to be ashamed of. But we are proud to be activists, activists in doing what we can to address this climate crisis facing our generation, generations to come, and active in, cover active in uncovering the truth about the fossil fuel industry's decades of denial and delay. 
As scientists before us have shown, speaking truth to power is a civic duty, and today's changing climate demands it. But we are also credentialed scientists. Our findings are not just opinions, as ExxonMobil claims. They are evidence-based conclusions that have passed the rigors of peer review by independent anonymous experts in our field. To the specific discussion about uh, this report, financed by ExxonMobil, this is, this is with respect precisely the sort of expert for hire doubt mongering that Professor Naomi Oreskes and Eric Conway documented in their book and film Merchants of Doubt, and which I've described in my testimony. Instead of subject, subjecting their criticisms to academic peer review as we do, Exxon pays an intellectual hit person to engage in attacks that have never undergone peer review, that have never been subject to objective independent scrutiny. This rattling off of a long list of accusations is doubt mongering 101. Exxon and their expert for hire know that I cannot practically demonstrate to you during the course of a live hearing that all of these accusations are false, even though I know that they are. Because firstly, this discussion would require you, all of you, to have a detailed familiarity with both our study and the methodology of content analysis. And secondly, because a committee hearing is not how science gets done. But none of this matters because to, Ex to, to Exxon because they don't need to win the debate. They just need to make it seem like there is one. I'd finally just remind you that the method that Professor Naomi Oreskes and I employed in our paper underwent peer review at a prestigious scientific journal. In contrast, Exxon paid someone to write something and then stick it on the internet. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Stefano, please. Very shortly from my side, we everybody knows what really means the term greenwashing. So we have really uh, visible on a global level the greenwashing from such energy companies. I also want to bring the attention to you that this is also coming from East, from example, from Russia, from Eastern part of Europe. This is very big and visible problem. So, sorry. So it will be difficult to answer all those uh, question comments that we just heard. But really, I believe that we really live in a political union at Europe that we have to start tackling this issue and start stopping. And I really want to see from you as a, our representative here how we continue this story, just not to stop it here. Because we have to see our future. We have to develop a better world for next generation. And it lays on us. Thank you. So. Thank you very much for everybody for this very interesting and very good dialogue. Thank you especially for our panelists. It's very clear that it will be good to continue also after the elections. We tried and uh, last, the very last information for members of Petty Committee, we continue at 2 p.m. in another room. Thank you, have a nice lunchtime.